house and so on. So a lot of this is being driven by regulation and compliance, but I haven't seen any particular hindrance to uh, the IT industry uh, uh, servicing Indian banks, either foreign IT companies or Indian IT companies. Thank you very much. If nobody else has a comment on that question, I just want to thank the panel, uh, and I look forward to the post-term submissions. Thank you. Commissioner Johansson. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Elliott, um, I was wondering if, if a company's intellectual property has been has not been protected in India, how difficult is it to seek judicial action, and how commonly do foreign intellectual property holders do this? Look, I I think um, I think it's quite clear that India does have quite a rigorous legal system. Uh, there's not much doubt about that. Uh, I think. A number of industry sectors and a number of com uh, companies will uh, articulate a degree of concern around some of the, uh, some of the court's interpretations on, on a, an array of different issues. Um, fundamentally, I think there is a problem in some instances where, in the way that laws are written, and in some cases it may well be that uh, it may well be how laws have been interpreted. Um, so I think there is certainly recourse, uh, and there are a number of instances where um, a, a lower court or a government body had made a decision where uh, the it seemed to be going against the trend of intellectual property, uh, and it was overturned on some sort of appeal. So there are certainly mechanisms there that are effective. Um, the, the problem, I think, comes in that there are some very, very high prominent and uh, very significant um, anomalies, such as the, the Section 3D uh, uh, law and its uh, its application to Novartis as Gleebeck, uh, and certainly the case of uh, Nexavar was uh, two particular examples that are quite concerning. Yes, uh, Mr. Schlesinger. Yes, just very briefly, um, and it's highlighted in greater detail in the written testimony, but. Um, our members do report some structural difficulties in the courts, and of course it varies state by state, so but with better results in Delhi, Mumbai, and Kolkata, and maybe less so in some of the newly <coughs> industrialized areas um, that also have um, courts there. Um, clogged dockets, procedural delays, problems with retaining evidence, so you go in for a raid and the evidence is then, then disappears or is given back to the defendant. Um, request to produce evidence of ownership or, or to produce actual witnesses from the right holders themselves, and then some difficulty enforcing civil court orders. Um, finally, just you know, the low levels of fines in most criminal cases are not even to the level of, of being able to account for the amount of intellectual property that has been stolen in the particular case. And there's a new um, potential <coughs> implementation in Delhi raising the costs of actually bringing a case um, when the threshold uh, reaches a certain uh, level, I think it's two crore, and this is going to create enormous difficulties for right holders. So I think all of these structural difficulties should be looked at, you know, in total um, by the Commission as, as part of some of the barriers or irritants to achieving, um, uh, achieving effective intellectual property protection. Yes, Mr. Uh, 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 Commissioner Johnson, I, I think, uh, you know, I India's bureaucratic and judicial system I I is notorious for its, you know, delays, backlogs in courts, et cetera, et cetera. So compared with that, what we've seen for intellectual property, especially foreign intellectual property holders in the last two months, it is nothing short of, uh, you know, I, I can't find the superlative views. It's just so fantastic compared to what it is in the rest. And I joke that you know, if we could have that due process in the rest of the economy, our per capita GDP would be twenty-five thousand dollars, not five thousand dollars. So, so, so I think it's important to keep that relative perspective in mind when you kind of evaluate how the how due process has worked uh, in IP in India. It's, it's been amazing. Yes, uh, Mr. Rao. Yeah, I'd like to come in on the same thing in terms of cyber cells. We've been trying to persuade in all the major cities 
the police to have a separate cell to investigate cyber crimes where they develop expertise and we provide training and so on. Actually, many of them have embraced it very well and these are considered prize jobs to get to become uh, a, a, a senior investigator in the cyber uh, crimes department. So we are seeing uh, quite a bit of that happening and we're, we're able to particularly um, harassment of women uh, on the web and using social media and so on, I'm finding that there is very quick reaction from the cyber cells that have come up in the main cities. So they are taking specific areas and moving quite fast, much faster than a typical sales tax dispute or something, which could be stuck for 18 years in the lower courts. That is for sure. There is greater speed in these areas because they consider good career opportunities for those individuals. Yes, I'm Mr. Bradova. Um, I, I just want to touch upon uh, the establishment of the IPAB, which, um, like what Mr. Subramanian had, had alluded to, has uh, tremendously improved the speed and the uh, and the disposal of the <coughs> Uh, it's patent and IP applications. Uh, but I also wanted to talk quickly about the judicial interpretation problem, right? India is a common law sovereign country. And uh, uh, look, a lot of academics have problems with the judicial interpretation of the federal circuit. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, yes, some of the lower level judges, like district court judges, could do with, you know, can be trained on more IP issues, but that's true about Oklahoma as well. I mean it when I say it, right? So uh, that kind of training can be imported everywhere in India is no exception. But barring that, as long as the law is applied and the law is logically and properly applied by a, a judge, uh, yes, businesses may be unhappy with it, but that's judicial interpretation by its very nature. So, um, you know, um, and I, I want to point out one example, and the example of Cambridge, about which uh, there have been several media reports, both here and in India. Uh, Cambridge was denied patentability, and, and one of the submissions, I think it's bio submission, that talks a lot about Cambridge and another drug that goes with it. Uh, it was a patent for a combination therapy for treating glaucoma, um, and uh, India denied uh, patents on Combigen, uh, the, the patent application on Combigen. Uh, but I actually went back and looked at the Federal Circuit decision, Allegra v. Sandals is a decision in the United States, and the Federal Circuit denied one of the main claims. There, there were two claims in the U.S. One was a method of treatment claim, and the other was a claim on the combination. And the Federal Circuit actually denied patent validity, invalidated it uh, in the U.S. as well. Similarly, at the EPO, uh, it, it was invalidated. Carmagen continues to be sold in the U.S. by the innovator because of the method of treatment claim, although the uh, claim one, which was the, uh, the claim that we're talking about, was invalidated in the U.S. as well. So, you know, some of the things that happen in India, and in fact, the IPAB decision <coughs> cites to the Federal Circuit's decision and, and kind of references it. Uh, so we really have to keep in mind that there is much more uh, persuasive value that's happening here. But you know, um, and uh, while some decisions may not be to the to the interest of business, uh, these are uh, you know these are happening within the, the the process that's been set up. So. All right. Thank you for your responses, and that uh, that's the end of my questions. Thank you. Can I just thank the panel for, uh, you know, uh, you've, you've worked with my time frame and, and allowed me to present today. I very much appreciate it, Mr. Powerson, Mr. Bishop. Uh, they've been very helpful. I very much appreciate it. And um, um, I want to leave before the strong hands. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for uh, coming. We really appreciate you, Jane. You scheduled the last minute and oh. Should we say thank you and risk to come to Washington? <laughs> 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 so, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, can anyone talk to me about the status of the bilateral investment treaty negotiations? I know we spent a long time in the U.S. looking at our model bit, and I think the Indians were asking us to do it, and it seemed like there was a lot of interest, and then suddenly they kind of pulled back, and I just wondered whether anyone's considering uh, showing interest on the, on the bit negotiations on the Indian side. Thank you. 
The, oh, sorry. The, the bilateral investment treaty, and we had uh, the U.S. Had, had India had been pushing the U.S. to get our model fit together for several years, if I remember correctly. And then once we did, India pulled back and decided to do some internal discussions. I think. So. Uh, particularly in the investment side, a uh, couple of cases involving uh, private companies. Uh, enabled this agreement to bypass Indian judiciary and go for arbitration outside India. And uh, this is where uh, internally government start, started thinking that look, uh, we need to relook at this investment uh, agreements with all countries, not just US. And there has been a review going on of all this uh, bilateral investment agreement. And second reason also was IPR in that. Uh, you proposed in the, in which has not been concluded, partly for this reason, that in their investment chapter, any appropriation of property by India will be referred to a tri tribunal outside India. Now, this was interpreted to mean that if you grant a compulsory license for an intellectual property, it would be treated as an appropriation of the property. And therefore, it would be subject to arbitration outside India, which would take over the sovereign power uh, of the country to decide on a compulsory license. So both this uh, the incidents which happen with uh, corporates and this demand from the EU uh, made government rethink on this and that's why uh, this has been put on the back burner for the time being and then in the last two, three years government became inward looking, uh, there are lots of problems and uh, now till new government comes. Uh, this will not make any moment, just like you in the FTA is also put on the back burner. So, so, so just, um, you know, you know, the Indian finance minister was here last year and, and said uh, that there were, there were two particular provisions which were uh, problematic <coughs> and they were reviewing that. And as you said, it's, it's now, uh, it, it had, I mean, interest in that had revived and now it's fallen back again. But I think the, the two things that uh, might change that are one, uh, a new government coming into power. But I think the second thing, uh, galvanizing uh, factor might be the US progress on the US-China. Uh, I, I, I think the more the US and China make progress, uh, it, it will have some impact on, on the way uh, India now regroups and, and start, starts thinking about the DIT. Uh, so, uh, for the moment, it's, it's, in, it's in limbo. So that's an optimistic comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well that's great. I mean, it brought up the other thing I wanted to know is what, what do you guys hear about the U.S., I mean, the FTA with negotiations with Europe and India, the FTA negotiations between Europe and India, and your sense is that they're, they're kind of stalled until the new government comes in. Okay. All right, do, do you get the sense that the Europeans are, are studying some of these problems and asking for fixes on some of the same problems the U.S. is? I, I, I think that the, 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 the India-EU uh, agreement was, um, I think, scuppered finally by, by the financial services chapter. Mm. Uh, and I think that, uh, again, uh, given what uh, Mr. Rao said in my own reading of the insurance bill, for example, that you know, it might, some things might move on the financial services side going forward, mm. Uh, I think uh, you know uh, one shouldn't be too pessimistic about that. For the moment, it seems uh, uh, you know in limbo, but I think with, with, with movement on financial services might and a new government might again change the dynamic there to some extent. Got it. Uh, Mr. Shah, did you have a comment on that? Uh, the two three issues of which uh, the time was lost. One was IPR, right? And eventually, EU agreed to give up the IPR demand. Which are taking some extension, 
Section 3D, data uh, exclusivity, all of that you agree not to push. But an automobile on uh, the wine industry, there were still issues. And India had issues about uh, when well, you signing it, but uh, when it came to uh, IT technicians going into any EU country, the EU country would still have uh, power not to grant visa. Now, this followed the negotiations. And now it could only happen after the new government. All right. And then, what do you think the, if the US actually succeeds in concluding the TPP? Where do you think concrete effects will be felt in India first? I mean, does anybody have a sense on uh, how that might have an effect or a disadvantage for, for the Indians? Excuse me, um, might not be clear. Uh, on, in the TPP negotiations in Asia that the U.S. is engaged in, will there be, are there clear things where we know there's going to be negative effects on India from that negotiation if it's successful? So in, in the study that we're doing, we, we have a, a chapter which addresses uh, this question. Um, the economic impact of uh, you know, a TPP and, and then a TPP plus a TTIP uh, on India and India-US trade. I, I think it turns out that uh, the order of magnitude is about a, a billion dollars in, in trade diversion. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's not Huge, uh, it's not insubstantial relative to India US trade. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not small change, it's sort of old. Uh, there, there is going to be some impact. Uh, I think the, the, the bigger impact will be uh, the, the, uh, what happens, especially if, if there is a sense that China might at some stage play ball on the TPP. I think then uh, the, uh, the fact that India might be isolated uh, on, on in trade terms. Is something that I think will get the attention of policymakers going forward. Okay, thank you. See, yeah, Mr. If I can just add to that, if, if the TPP is done right, it becomes a trade agreement comprised of countries that hold themselves to the very highest standards of setting the conditions in which innovative industries can flourish. And you would see that uh, if they had strong data exclusivity measures, you would see that if they had trade secret protections. So if the TPP succeeds and puts in place a set of rules where innovative countries can flourish, then I think India would be disadvantaged uh, by not being a part of that environment. Okay. Um, so I guess I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Pete? Uh, thank you all again. Uh, questions to follow up on uh, them. Uh, maybe if I could just ask for uh, submissions in the post committee <coughs> to, to build upon the theme that, that Mr. Shaw and Mr. Supermanian and others have highlighted the idea of evidence-based rather than perception-based thinking. Could, um, it, it would really help, I think, if if you could, uh, any of you could provide information about the uh, extent to which price discrimination regimes operate badly or successfully, and what uh, companion um, uh, characteristics or factors uh, might need to uh, be present to get one outcome or the other. For example, uh, you could imagine measures that mitigate or restrict arbitrage. Those measures could be physical or they could be legal. You could discuss the costs of those different measures, social and individual. Uh, and you could also think about another measure, like uh, uh, the ability for a, uh, an outcry, hey, uh, that, that person got a better price than I did, so I want that person's price, which is, that's different than arbitrage, that's a kind of um, um, claim for equality. Uh, 
you know, it would help to have information about how often people make that claim, who makes that claim, do they make that claim while simultaneously uh, advocating a lower price for uh, 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 for themselves uh, um, uh, through a non-market mechanism. Uh, in other words, uh, how in, how consistent are the behaviors by those making the claims? Uh, do people respond to the claims? Do do the do individual companies? In fact, I think Mr. Shaw was highlighting some case studies where we saw uh, uh, some companies being quite interested in maximizing output, minimizing debt. That sounds wonderful. That sounds like a win-win for society and for the for the IP owner. Um, why did other companies not tap in that direction? To the extent you could, any of you could provide that information, that would really help help us understand the effects of these things. Uh, and that concludes my questions. Thank you each very much. Thank you. I have a series of questions here. Uh, first thing is the commission is sufficient to quantify the effects of certain restricted trade and invest barriers. Now, I was wondering if you could suggest any indices, measures, or estimates that could help us quantify the effect of the barriers that have been cited. You know, the OECD publishes measures of FDI restricting it by country and sector, but independent, I don't think there are really independent estimates for technology transfer and possible forced localization, maybe some of the other barriers that have been cited today. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on this now or post here. The, the, um, suppose the, uh, on services, the, the World Bank also has, has, has a database of restrictions by sector, by countries, uh, 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 and covers FDI as well. <coughs> uh, that's a mode of delivery for, uh, for, for services. The, um, not the, 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 there is another database which has both a tariff and non-tariff barriers, which is actually bilateral, bilateral and product specific. Um, I, I can use the, uh, I've used it extensively, so I would be happy to pass it on. As you know from my written testimony, you know, the IIPA recites several metrics. Metrics are extremely difficult, both in the area of piracy as a non-tariff barrier because you're trying to, you know, sort of prove a negative in the absence of this distortion. What would the, what would the outcome be? Um, and you're also trying to prove what the actual cost is. But I do think that the software industry has done a fairly good job in its studies over the years of um, demonstrating a percentage of the um, hardware market that's not serviced or not um, filled with legitimate software, as an example. Um, I would point to also um, the Basket Frontier Economic Study um, and then the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, which you know has mentioned some metrics as well. Um, and then the uh, piracy impact studies. On the, on the market access side, again, I think that you know these metrics are extremely difficult. I mean, how do you prove the fact that South India, the South Indian states impose theatrical quotas? So in the absence of those quotas, how many foreign films would actually be able to avail themselves of the market and what would the, the revenue uh, flow be from the, that market availability? So um, we'll obviously ha are very happy to work with the commission to try and come up with the objective data with the evidence-based um, analysis so that um, your report um, properly reflects that. But I, I just note at the outset that these metrics are sometimes very difficult to um, come to ex uh, with exactitude. Um, and I would add the GATT's Commitments Restrictiveness Index uh, or India's score of 6.69 is one of the lowest of all the Baltic countries. The, it's, a, it's an indice of uh, services market openness. Yeah. We have done a detailed study of this methodology and brought out the pros in that index. So I would submit that commission should study the analysis that we will be submitting uh, on the index, how it has been developed and uh, used, and uh, the pros in that index before taking it 
view of uh, India's uh, status. Thank you for your responses. Another question that, and people have talked a lot about various barriers. One of the things that they haven't heard much discussion of, what is the employment impact of the U.S. Uh, from barriers? Are there any indices or measures of, you know, this was changed, what might impact might it have on the U.S.? And I'm particularly thinking about it in the services sector. Yeah, I was just trying to think. I think today, in the services space, at the end, the biggest thing that is, strictly speaking, not a trade issue, but the immigration issue is what everyone's talking about. Um, will a higher cost of an H visa and L visa result in more work moving offshore? and less revenues, uh, value getting created in the US. That's the question that we're all debating. Um, but uh, independently, it looks as if Congress is determined to continue to keep increasing uh, the cost of these visas um, for the uh, overseas uh, IT service provider. So I, I don't know. I mean, that's the... That's the one that we're all talking about. We're not talking about anything in the trade area. Certainly, the, some of the tax issues uh, in terms of um, uh, transfer pricing and in terms of uh, uh, taxing uh, uh, software uh, imports, uh, which NASCOM is very actively engaged with, with the government of India to get clarity on that. Uh, that's a secondary one. The biggest one is not the trade one, but what is really movement of people immigration? And how many young, how many Indian entrepreneurs are not going to be started in Silicon Valley because of these policies? Because well, that would be you know I, if they don't have access to a team. You see, what happens really is they have a team of fifteen or twenty people who do the product development, and they'll have a front end team of five or six people in California. Usually, that's what a startup. Has. It has a ratio like that where you have a development team in Bangalore or Hyderabad. Now, that gives them a lot of flexibility. First of all, it's outsourced. It's a variable cost. They can get rid of it any time. On top of that, it's cheaper. On top of that, they get uh, greater uh, talent base. For instance, if you wanted 15 Java programmers in <coughs> Bangalore, you can get them in half a day. You just needed to make two calls to two headhunters. To get 15 Java programmers in Silicon Valley will take you four months. So you can't get started even. You won't, you know. So there's that. That that would be interesting to see what what impact that could have um, on them. They're not going to stop it. I think this whole visa thing is going to create. We'll use Skype more or something like that. You know, we'll just get around some of these movement of people restrictions, that's what the industry will do. Um, but um, it, it, it would be interesting to see what the overall impact on startups would be if suddenly tomorrow India disappeared into the sea. Would startups in Silicon Valley suffer disproportionately? I would guess yes, very much so. Thank you. Who says? Yes, so as you'll see in our written testimony, you know, we offered a very specific jobs impact of the effects of India's PMA in the year 2020. That will cost you about 10,500 jobs annually. And I think more broadly, as the commission takes this line of inquiry, um, it's important to look at where uh, India's market access barriers have cost us you know, export opportunities from the United States. We ran a $20 billion trade deficit with India last year, about a $100 billion trade deficit with past decades, we haven't run a surplus with India since 1985. So if you think that uh, we know from the Department of Commerce that uh, every extra $1 billion in exports of manufactured products supports 6,250 jobs, we know that a billion dollar war in exports supports 9,000 agricultural jobs. You know, if we just ran balanced trade with India by increasing our exports by $20 billion a year to even it, uh, we'd have you know possibly 120,000 more jobs in the United States. That's not chump change. So I think uh, this is something that, that the commission uh, uh, should look at this inquiry. Um, 
Another quick question. I'm going to leave those answers.